All right, let's get started. In lecture 10, we started with our antibody identification. We talked about the crossing off procedure and the um, process of antibody identification. So the ones we have done in lecture 10 were pretty straightforward, single antibody identification, okay? We're gonna step it up a notch. We're gonna start identifying multiple antibodies. So when a patient has multiple antibodies, there are some techniques that blood bank can use um, to get rid of reactions so you can identify other underlying reactions. However, when you do techniques, whether it be neutralization, enzyme treatments, just because those reactions go away, you still have to identify the antibody to which the reactions went away, all right? Just because the reactions went away doesn't mean that antibody is not there anymore. It just means you've got rid of the reactions to see what else is reacting, okay? Um, so always don't forget to identify all of the reacting antibodies, all right? All right, so when would you suspect multiple antibodies? Um, when you have, most of your screening cells are gonna be positive. So routinely in blood bank, you're gonna have an 11 cell uh, panel, all right? So if 10 out of 11 of those cells are positive, you might think you have multiple antibodies or you have an antibody to an antigen that is present on pretty much every cell, all right? Um, so if all of your screening cells are positive, um, keep that in mind too. And if you have reactions of varying strengths, all right, so if you have some two plus reactions, some three plus reactions, then that could indicate either number one, multiple antibodies, or what else? Dosage, all right. Um, and then if you have reactions in different phases, right, so maybe you have an antibody that's reacting at initial spin, um, and then it's warming up, but then you also have some reactions at AHG phase of testing. That will let you know that you have multiple antibodies present, okay? Maybe you're dealing with an IgM antibody and an IgG antibody, okay? Um, and so that's another key that you have multiple antibodies. If all of your panel cells are positive and your auto control is positive, that really is going to indicate that you're dealing with a warm auto antibody, okay? Um, or, or, or if you're, it's reacting initial span, it could be a cold autoantibody as well. So um, make sure you pay attention to that auto control. If every cell on that panel is positive, you have a reaction and your auto control is negative, you're either dealing with a pub, an antibody to a public antigen or you're dealing with multiple antibodies, okay? So that's why we have to investigate, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about. If you suspect more than one antibody is present and you have all of those reactions, if every cell is positive on that panel, can you rule anything out? No, right? Because we rule out with the negative reactions in our patient plasma. So if we have all positive reactions, we can't rule anything out, okay? So we have, that's when blood bank can implement some techniques to try to get rid of some of those reactions and then we can rule out and rule in, okay? So it's very important you pay attention to the temperature of the reactions. Is it only reacting at AHG? Is it only reacting at initial spin? Um, is it reacting at 37 and AHG? Those are some clues that kind of help you hone in on which antibody you might be dealing with. Strength of reaction, is it very weak? Um, is it um, stronger on some cells, weaker on other cells? If you're dealing with multiple antibodies, it usually will have a stronger reaction on the cell where maybe you have two antibodies, where both antigens are present on that cell, you will usually have a stronger agglutination in your patient's plasma, all right? So that's one way you can pick up on different variant strengths of reaction, might indicate multiple antibodies. Enzyme treatment, um, let's say you're dealing with a panel that reacted with every cell, except your auto control is negative. One thing that we can do is we can run an enzyme treatment. Keeping in mind your enzyme treatment, also you might hear it referred to as fysin. Um, the fysin treated cells, your M, N, and S system are destroyed and your Duffy system are destroyed, right? So if you have one of those antibodies, those reactions are gonna go away, okay? And then you're gonna be left with um, any of your RHs, your Kells, your Lewis's, those reactions will remain. Sometimes 
your RHs and your kids are even enhanced by enzymes. All right, so those reactions will go stronger. And we're gonna look at some examples of what that would look like, okay? Um, neutralization, if you're dealing with a Lewis A or a Lewis B, you can do what we call um, neutralization. It's a um, commercially manufactured substance. It's a soluble antigen, and you can add it to patient plasma. That soluble antigen will absorb out that patient's anti-Lewis A or Lewis B, okay? So then if you repeat your testing, the Lewis A and Lewis B will no longer be reacting, right? We, then we have some negative reactions that we can rule out, right? Keep it in mind though, if you make those reactions go away, you still have to honor that patient's antibody, okay? And again, if you have one set of reactions at room temperature, um, another set of reactions at AHG, you can usually uh, look at your pattern of reactivity. We know which antibodies can react at initial spin. We know which antibodies can um, react at AHG. So typically you can pick out the, the pattern of reactivity um, and then you maybe can run some select cells to uh, definitively identify those antibodies. So if you guys remember that chart in your lecture manual that has all of their reaction temperatures, um, it will come into be very useful when you're dealing with multiple antibodies. All right, so let's just take an example. And this is, of course, not a whole panel, just kind of a snippet of panels, but this is what some reactions would look like if you had multiple antibodies. Notice that we have an antibody that's reacting at initial spin, two plus. We also have some reactions at 37. Notice that the cells that are reacting at initial spin in 37 go away at AHG. Okay, um, and then notice that the AHG reactions do not have reactions at initial spin in 37. So we are definitely dealing with multiple antibodies here. All right, so screening cells one, two, and four are reacting at initial spin in 37. Uh, panel cell three, five, and six are reacting at AHG. Okay, so we are dealing with uh, two different antibodies here. And if you take a look, um, and on your antibody chart, it says that Lewis A and Lewis B can react at initial spin 37 and AHG, okay? So in this instance, if you look, Lewis A is positive on panel cell one, two, and four, where our initial spin and 37 are reacting, okay? Um, however, Lewis A is negative where we have our AHG reactions, okay? So something else is causing the AHG reactions. And if you look, um, at your JKA and JKB family, JKB is present on three, five, and six. But why do our reactions with AHG have different strengths? It is dosage, right? Notice that panel cell five is homozygous positive for JKB, right? This cell is only expressing antigens of the JKB. <clears throat> That gives us a two plus reaction in the patient plasma, all right? Versus panel cell three and six are heterozygous, all right? So they have both JKA antigen sites and JKB antigen sites on that cell. Therefore, there's not as many binding opportunities for that patient's antibody, so we will have a weaker reaction, all right? Does everybody understand that? Okay. So this is an example, this is a really good example, even though it's not the full panel, of how you can have multiple antibodies reacting at different phases and also demonstrating dosage, okay? So we identify in this patient uh, plasma, we have anti-Lewis A reacting at initial spin in 37, but we also have anti-JKB. Um, and so this is just a frequency. So the most common antibody you'll probably see in blood bank, um, anti-D, sometimes you might even see it with anti-C, big C, and big E. Um, Anti-Lewis A and Lewis B, you will see that quite frequently in your African-American population and in pregnant females. Um, they can occur one or the other, or you might even see them together. It is possible to have both of them. Remember, because it is the Lewis A negative, Lewis B negative genotype that will build the corresponding Lewis antibodies, 
okay? If you're Lewis A positive, B negative, you're typically not gonna build anti-Lewis B, all right? Usually you're gonna be negative for both of them in order to build an antibody to the Lewis family, okay? Um, and then anti-Kel, you guys will see anti-Kel um, very frequently in blood bank. Um, Anti-E, um, and then anti-little C, and we have an example we're going to look at. It's called the blocked E. If you take a look at panels, all of the panel cells, they're pretty much all going to be little c positive. All right, so that means your population is pretty much little c positive. It's very hard if you think you have anti-little c to rule out anti-big E. Um, they sometimes, the way the um, RH genes are inherited, it's very hard to rule out. You're not going to find a C negative, big E positive cell. All right. And so we have an example where I'm going to show you that. And notice um, that you have down here at the bottom, here's your anti E. Remember, that's extremely rare because 98% of the population has the little E antigen. Okay. So the more people that have the antigen, the less likely it is for people to build antibodies. But you will see some, right? Like my example, patient in the OR that had the anti-little E on a Saturday in blood bank when you're by yourself. Okay, so it can happen. It will happen. All right. You, um, Duffy A is down here at the bottom, least frequently, or Duffy B. Um, but you will see some sickle cell patients that have anti-Duffy B. All right, they'll also probably have anti-E, uh, maybe anti kel Sickle cell patients are a very complex blood bank workup because they've been transfused so much, they've built multiple antibodies. Um, so here's kind of what I was talking about, about the, um, when you have little c, it tends to travel with uh, big E. So it's very hard to, it's usually very hard if you have anti-C to find big E negative cells. Here's another example of dosage, All right? If we have another JK, uh, anti-JKB, notice that panel cell three, which is heterozygous, and panel cell six is heterozygous, gives us a one plus reaction, okay? Versus panel five, which is homozygous, gives us a two plus reaction, okay? The kid family, JKA and JKB, is notorious for dosage. Also, the MNN family is notorious for dosage. So you should only think about dosage if the reactions vary? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you have to demonstrate dosage. You could have a, antibody, a patient antibody reacting with every panel cell where the antigen is present at equal strength. Maybe it's all two plus. That's, that could be normal too. We always just have to keep dosage in mind because we don't want to miss um, not identifying an antibody. Because the problem comes into play with dosage if, if your heterozygous positive cells give you a negative reaction. That's possible. So that's why it always takes two heterozygous cells to completely rule out an antigen when you're doing the crossing off procedure. Okay. And even then, um, and I've seen anti-M do this, all of the cells that are heterozygous, M positive and N, um, positive could give you a negative reaction, but all of the M homozygous cells would give you a positive reaction. Um, in that instance, you could try to, uh, anti-M is a known IgM antibody, you might try to refrigerate those negative tubes for a little bit to make that IgM antibody pop out. Um, that's a technique you could use too, to make those heterozygous cells pop out. Because there's just so few, if your patient's antibody is already weak, and there's so few antigen sites on that panel cell, uh, then it's going to give you a weak reaction, or it could even be a negative reaction. Okay, so enzyme treatment. You might hear it referred to as um, Fison, might hear it referred to as papain, but what it is, it's a proteolytic enzyme, and what it does is it breaks off the sialic acid from the cell membrane. So when we're doing enzyme treatment, we are treating the cells. Okay, which is different from neutralization where we treat patient plasma. 
Okay, so enzyme treatment is the cells. And so it destroys, after enzyme treatment, removing that sialic acid, it destroys your M, N, and S expression and your Duffy A and Duffy B, okay? So if your patient has an antibody to one of those and you do enzyme treatment, repeat your testing, then those reactions are gonna go negative, all right? And the reason we can do that in blood bank is it allows us to identify any other underlying antibodies, okay? So if you have, think about a Duffy um, A, which you might have eight of your 11 cells are gonna be positive, all right? So there's really, you need more negative cells for ruling out to see if anything else is reacting. That's the purpose of the enzyme treatment. Um, and I wanted to show you a trick. How you know which antibodies are um, destroyed by enzyme. All right, so take a look. This is a three cell screen manufactured by ortho, right? So this is your IAT, but it's the same on the panel. Notice all of the shaded columns. Duffy A and Duffy B are shaded. M and N, big S and little s are shaded, correct? Those are destroyed by enzyme, all right? So that's, that's a little trick um, that you can always look at your panels. If you have a, a brain malfunction and forget which ones are destroyed, you know you can always check your panel. Duffy A, Duffy B, M, N, and S. Some students ask me, well, why are those columns shaded? That's why. They're destroyed by enzyme. All right, so the way enzyme treatment works, you can do it two different ways. You can um, purchase enzyme-treated commercial manufactured cells, which is why these columns are shaded, because ortho provides those already enzyme-treated cells. Or you can purchase the enzyme reagent, the Fison reagent, treat your panel cells yourself, um, and then rerun your test using patient plasma. Most blood banks are going to buy them already commercially enzyme treated. Um, it's probably easier, cheaper to do it that way. All right. All right. So we have established that enzyme is going to destroy your MNS, big S and little s, and your Duffy A and Duffy B also going to enhance some reactions. It's going to enhance your RH, it's going to enhance your kid. Sometimes you'll even see it enhance your Lewis A and Lewis B reactions if they're there, okay? And again, we usually only use this technique if you're trying to identify multiple antibodies. So for those sickle cells that have multiple antibodies, you'll probably always wanna do an enzyme treatment. And again, the way this works is you'll have your initial panel with multiple reactions, and you're gonna say, wow, I have you know, more than one antibody reacting here, I need some negative reactions. You're going to grab your enzyme-treated cells, mix those with your patient plasma, um, and that's repeating the test. So then you have your initial panel reactions, and then you have your enzyme reactions. And as we look at some of these examples, you're gonna see that, all right? Typically, when you do enzyme, um, we only concentrate on the AHG phase of reaction. However, some of the examples that are given, they repeat the enzyme testing in all three phases, initial span, 37, and AHG. My experience in blood bank, we only repeated enzyme treatment at AHG. So, and again, after enzyme treatment, red cells are retested with patient plasma. All right, so, after enzyme treatment, if you had a cell that was previously reacting with your patient plasma, and then after enzyme treatment, then you have a negative reaction, what does that tell you? It's probably one of those that we know. It's probably one of those that we know is destroyed by enzyme treatment, M, N, big S, or little s, or your Duffy, okay? So if you have, after enzyme treatment, and then your reactions go negative, that lets you know, hey, I'm dealing with Duffy A or Duffy B, M or N, big S or little s, okay? If after enzyme treatment, your reactions become stronger, what do you think you're dealing with? RH. RH, kid, maybe Lewis, all right? Not, not so often Lewis, but definitely your RHs and your JKA and JKB. 
Um, so I had a student that drew this just to help her remember. So if you think about Fison as a lawnmower, right? So here's your Fison, all right? And then here's your red cell membrane. And then here's your antigens kind of acting as the grass, right? Notice that you have your RH antigens, you have your tail, you have your JKA. Um, they're all along the cell membrane, okay? Notice that your MN, your S's, and your W's kind of extend out from the cell membrane. Remember, they're on that sialic axis. And remember, that's the function of Fison, right? Fison's going to come in, it's going to remove that sialic acid from the cells. Therefore, WA, WB, M and N, big S and little s are no longer on that cell membrane. That's why they cannot, that's why your patient's antibody cannot react. All right, so if this helps you remember the role of Fison, um, I thought it would be a very useful tool, okay? Um, I had a student share it with me, and I'm like, it makes perfect sense. Um, she did have tail listed here, so I changed it. So, all right, um, so that, that helps you think of Fison as a lawnmower. It's going to remove M, N, and S, and use that. Okay. So if you guys ever come up to anything, I will use it. So if you share something with me that you remember, I use She even put the midlife science performing, pushing the one more. I mean, pretty simple, but it's a graphic that might help you remember. And um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the LSU Clean Lab Science Review Book for your Board of Certification. It has little cartoons in it like this. Um, that's why, that's what I recommend for students to study with. All right, so let's take a look at um, an example. This is an abbreviated panel. Of course, it's not the full panel, but just to let you know. So here we're only looking at anti-B, which is in our RH family, right? And we're also looking at WA, all right? What do we know about D after enzyme treatment? They get stronger, it's enhanced, okay? What do we know about WA after enzyme treatment? It goes away, right? So it's negative. All right, so at initial span, we, we have all negative reactions. Look at 37. On every panel cell that we ran, all except one, we have reactions at 37 degrees. Notice that the reactions get stronger at AHG. That is very common with RH antibodies. They tend to react at 37, and then they get stronger at AHG. All right. Um, so, and then we also have this one cell that even gives us a three plus reaction. So can you do any rule out? Can you rule out anything? You have no, and remember we can only rule out when we have completely negative reactions, right? So even though um, this cell is negative at initial span of 37, it pops up positive at AHG, right? So we can't really perform our crossing off procedure um, using any of these cells. All right, so what's a good treatment we could do? We could try to do enzyme, right? And notice after enzyme, our reactions got much stronger. And notice where our reactions got much stronger, they're all positive for D, all right? So uh, panel cell one, two, three, four, and six. Now all that originally had a two plus, Reaction now have three plus reactions. So the Duffy A reactions went away. The D reactions got stronger. All right. So that's an example of how enzyme works. We still don't have very many negative cells, um, but at least now we know that whatever is reacting got stronger with enzyme. So that kind of holds us into um, a smaller group of antibodies that we're dealing with. Okay. Why is panel cell two? giving us a three plus reaction at AHG, when all the other ones gave us a two plus. Both, antibody, both antigens are present on this cell. The patient has antibodies to both of these antigens. So that's why we have a stronger reaction, right? Not only is anti-D binding to the cell, but also the patient's that the A is binding to the cell given us a stronger agglutination in the patient's plasma. All right, does everybody see that? So that's an example of where you have multiple antibodies causing a stronger reaction. Okay. Why is panel cell five negative at 37 degrees? 
Does it have D? Right? So that the A is reacting. So this really hones you in that you're dealing with another antibody other than D, right? Because you have another positive cell. Okay. So if you were to look at your pattern of reactivity, every D positive cell is reacting both at 37 and AHD, except for panel five, uh-oh, something else is causing this reaction. So something else is reacting other than D. So that lets you know you're dealing with another antibody. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? So what would you do after the enzyme treatment and you still don't have three negatives? So after enzyme treatment, you still have a lot of positive cells. That's a really good question. What could you do? Do you know what your two probably uh, primary antibodies are? We still need to find out if there's anything else going on. What could we do? Does anybody remember what we talked about? Does anybody remember select cells? So you could choose your cells. That's why they're called select cells. You could choose a D negative cell and a Duffy A negative cell um, and then positive for which other antigens you wanted that you were trying to rule out. And if you had a negative reaction, that indicates nothing else is reacting, right? So you would have to definitely run more cells. But now this helps you know what's reacting and you can choose some negative cells to get negative reactions. Does that make sense to everybody? You would definitely have to do some select cells. And this just kind of describes uh, what we talked about, interpretation of that enzyme treated panel, that example. All right, so that's enzyme. I want you guys to not confuse enzyme treatment with neutralization. Enzyme treatment, let me say this one more time, enzyme treatment, you are treating your commercial red cells, okay? Neutralization, you are treating patient plasma to absorb out that antibody, right? An example of um, antibodies that can be neutralized, definitely your Lewis family, that's probably the number one instance you will use it. If you're ever dealing with a P1 antibody, it can be neutralized out as well. So how neutralization works, it's commercially manufactured. It's a soluble antigen. Um, you can buy it. it. It's in a clear liquid. It's in a vial. And you add it to patient plasma. Okay, so that soluble antigen to the Lewis A or Lewis B is going to absorb out that Lewis A or Lewis B antibody in your patient plasma. Okay, so that previously reacting Lewis A or Lewis B after neutralization, when you repeat your panel, you're going to have negative reactions, okay? You could also do it, um, remember we talked about the secretor status, um, and remember if you're a secretor, you'll have some of these antigens being expressed in your saliva, so you could also use this technique for um, H um, and you could do it for I, I guess, too, but Lewis A and Lewis B is the most common reason for neutralization in blood banks. And so here's some examples. Uh, Lewis A and Lewis B, your P, uh, Chida Rogers, and then um, SBA. So these are some that can be neutralized out. And again, you're inactivating your Lewis, um, Lewis A or Lewis B. So you're gonna have negative reactions. So here's an example. All right, so just concentrate on, don't look at the neutralization yet, all right? Just look at your initial span, your 37 and your AHG. Notice that your reactions are all across the boards on that. You have some at initial span, you have some at 37, you have some at AHG. Notice that the ones that initial span in 37 go away at AHG. Notice some are only reacting at AHG. So you definitely have two, um, potentially only two different antibodies reacting here. All right, and then if you take a look, Lewis A, who is known to react at initial span in 37, um, 
is on panel cell one, two, and four. Um, and then we have another antibody that's reacting at AHG only. Um, and so we can hone in that he's possibly JKB, all right? Um, so if we neutralize your patient's plasma, treat it with our commercially soluble anodin, which will absorb out that Lewis, notice after neutralization, our, all of our initial spin and 37 reactions are negative, all right, because that anti-Lewis is no longer able to react. It has been absorbed out. However, our AHG reactions remain. Okay, so this is an example how you can get rid of some reactions to identify any other underlying antibodies. All right, does everybody see that? Dosage. So Sarah asked if the neutralization was showing dosage. So it's not, not neutralization showing dosage. You do have dosage, right? So notice with your AHG, in your original AHG reaction, you have one plus and two plus. Why are cells three and six one plus? Panel, so oh yeah, sorry, I was looking at the wrong column. Yeah, both are being expressed here, right? Heterozygous, weaker <laughs> antigenic expression gives us a weaker reaction in patient plasma, right? Versus panel cell four is, um, or sorry, panel cell five is homozygous positive, okay? That's definitely dosage being demonstrated there. But notice your reactions were like that before neutralization treatment, and then they also remain that way after neutralization, right? So it's actually present in both um, testing, okay? Sarah, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, so let's think about if you have high and low incidence antibodies. And think about another word for incidence is frequency, right? So if you have a high frequency antibody, that means that an antibody is made to an antigen that the majority of the population has. It's a public antigen um, and it's a antibody to a public anti antibody, okay? Um, an example of that would be Chilano, right? 99.9% .9 of the population is positive for little k. Um, another example is Lutheran B, all right? Most of the majority of the population is going to be positive for little b. If you have a rare patient that is negative for one of these antigens and gets exposed to a donor unit or maybe during pregnancy for females and they build this antibody, it is very difficult to find um, antigen negative blood for them. It's also very difficult for us to identify because all of our panel cells are going to react, okay? Um, so maybe you're not dealing with multiple antibodies. Maybe you're dealing with a high incident antibody to a high incident antigen. Okay. So here's an example. Take a look at Chilano. Right. Notice if you look in your Chilano and Chilano's little k. Notice in the column for little k, only one panel cell is negative for Chilano. So that, if your patient has an antibody to Chilano, that means every panel cell is going to react, except for that one. So you're only gonna have one negative reaction to do your coughing off procedure, okay? Do you think you can rule everything out with that one cell? No, and it is very, very difficult to find Chilano negative cells, okay? And so this is an example of what an antibody to a public antigen looks like, but notice, it's not an autoantibody because we do have one negative cell and our auto control is negative. Okay, so it's definitely not an auto. When blood makers see something like this, our mind automatically goes to autoantibody when everything reacts, right? Um, but the auto control is negative and we do actually have one negative cell. So it's definitely not a warm auto. Um, there's another one, let's see. 
take a look, look at Lutheran B on this panel. And this is always a good representation of your population. If you want to know how um, often an antigen occurs in your population, look at your panel, all right? Lutheran B, every panel cell is positive, all right? That just goes along with about 99% of the population is going to have the Lutheran B antigen, okay? Um, and then you can also look at little E, all right? Little E is notorious, only one negative panel cell. All right, so that just goes to show that 98% of the population is little e positive. Okay. So you can kind of gauge um, your energy frequency by looking at the panel. Okay, so what can we do? What, are, what is blood makers going to do with all these positive reactions? Does this patient have any underlying antibodies? Hard to say, right? I mean, we could do rule out with that one cell, but not everything is going to be ruled out. So we have another treatment. It's actually called um, DDT. And I think I talk about it, maybe it's upcoming. But DDT, um, it's a combination of enzymes and it's a diethyl et al, I think, the chemical. And what it does is it destroys your cell antigen sites. All right, so you could do that treatment. You're treating the cells. And then you could repeat your testing and all of these Tolano reactions are gonna go away, okay? <coughs> all right, so there's another incident in blood bank that you guys need to be aware of. So that's if most of your population is antigen positive. What if most of your population is antigen negative? Think about what you do on every patient. You do an antibody screen on every patient, right? What if your patient had Lutheran A? If your patient had anti-Lutheran A, would this IAT pick it up? Here's your Lutheran A negative on all three cells. What's your IAT going to be for your patient? Your IAT is going to be negative. However, what happens if you go to do a cross-match on that patient? The donor unit you cross-match happens to be Lutheran A positive. You're going to have an incompatible cross-match. Right? That is the most common way blood bankers pick up on one of these low-incident antibodies. Okay? You're going to have a negative IAT. Blood bank's going to think everything's happy-go-lucky. patient can be transfused. And then, oh, wait a minute. Why is my cross-match compatible? Right? Most oftentimes, it's because your patient has an antibody to one of these low frequency antigens, right? Um, so, and as we start looking at and interpreting cross match results, keep that in mind. You will have several cases involving that, right? Why is your IAT negative, but your cross match incompatible, right? That's one reason. Um, and so, just to give you that, this is low frequency, meaning that about 1% only have the antigen. All right, the majority of the population is going to be antigen negative. And so think about what that means for our screening cells. All right, our screening cells are going to be antigen negative, so we're not going to be able to detect that antibody. Okay, that's the problem. Um, another word, low incidence or private. All right, so it's private because most of the majority of the population don't have it. All right, so it's usually private to that specific person that does have it. <laughs> Uh, so CW is another example. Notice that it's all negative on your IAT. JSA is another example. KPA. And then your Lutheran A. Notice that they are all negative on your IAT. And this is actually a three-cell screen. Um, there's another process in blood bank that we do, and it's called an elution. I think we've talked a little bit about this. Remember, if you're doing your DAT, and you have a positive DAT, that means something is coding patient cells. We want to find out what exactly is coding patient cells. So we will do, excuse me, we will do an elution. Um, it could be an acid treatment where you use acid at a low pH to dissociate that antigen from the red cell membrane, um, or it can be a heat treatment. Um, and we will talk about um, also, it could be a, a, a freeze. So what happens when you freeze cells? Anybody know? 
they lice. All right, so if you freeze the cells, they lice. If you spin that suspension down, then you're left with the antibody that was coating the cell. Once those cells lice, that antibody is free, all right? It's unbound, and then we can test the eluate. That's called a Lewy freeze. Um, we do that when we suspect any type of ABO, hemolytic disease of the newborn, okay? Um, the acid treatment you usually do to identify any other type of IgG antibody. All right, so you can do acid treatment, heat treatment, or you could do a freeze method. All right. That is when you have a positive VAT. And what it does is it separates the antibody that's coating patient cells. After this treatment, your cells are no longer viable. This is a lysine procedure, right? Some way those cells are being lysed to release that antibody, okay? Um, and then once you spin those lysed cells down, we test the supernatant, all right, the eluate. Um, and you guys will actually get to do this at the end of the semester. You will actually get to do an elution. All right, so here's your Louis freeze. Um, so you put your uh, baby cells, so this is usually done on uh, neonatals, put them in a uh, saline suspension, tilt your tube, coat the sides of your tube, and then you're going to put it uh, horizontal in the freezer for about 10 to 15 minutes just to let them freeze. And then you're going to bring it out and you're going to run it under lukewarm water let those cells uh, thaw out, and that is the lysing procedure. So now your cells have gone through the freezing and thawing process, they're lysed, their um, antibody remains in the supernatant, unbound antibody. And then we can test it with our cells and identify what the antibody was. Um, the acid elution, it really just uses a very low pH to dissociate the antigen from the antibody, or from the, uh, from the antibody from your red cell. Typically, you're only going to do the Louis freeze for ABO investigations on babies. The acid elution is what you would do any other, like a positive DAT on an adult. But both are lysing, so the cells will no longer be viable. So we're testing the supernatant. So as, as you guys start working in the blood bank, um, each of you will be in contact with the reference lab. There are some instances where you might have some nonspecific reactivity in your patient plasma that doesn't really fit a pattern, um, antigen expression on your panel cells, or maybe you have a very uh, weird, maybe you suspect you have a Diego or a Chida Rogers, some of those weird antibodies, you would definitely want to forward that to the reference lab for confirmation, whether it be uh, for a molecular phenotype, or for further identification, especially if you're working at a smaller rural hospital um, and you don't have all the antisera available or the testing reagents necessary to do these complex workups, you will forward that patient sample to the reference lab. Sometimes it does involve collecting uh, another blood bank sample. So um, some of, as these workups get very complex, we will use a lot of sample, um, especially if you're doing a elution, they have a positive DAT and you're doing an elution, um, you're doing multiple treatments like um, enzyme treatment, you're using a lot of patient sample. Um, and so sometimes we have to request the drawing of a new sample. Um, so a good established relationship with that reference lab. They will help you identify um, unique antibodies or rare antibodies. They will also help you find blood for difficult patients, such as your sickle cell patients that maybe have multiple antibodies like Big E, Duffy A, JKB, um, they will help you find phenotypically matched units for those patients. Sometimes if you're dealing with the warm auto, a lot, unless you're working at a very large institution, you probably won't have the reagents available to do um, multiple absorption treatments to try to absorb out that warm auto. So that would be an example that would be forwarded on to the reference lab. I've had, um, and keep in mind, you have to keep in mind your methodology of testing. So here at UAMS, we use the gel technology, which you guys will get to see next week. Um, and so a lot of times we would have some nonspecific reactions with our patient plasma, and then we would forward it to the reference lab for them to help us ID it. And they use tube method, all right, what you guys have been doing. Um, and I'm going to do today for your IAT. Um, and so they would not pick up the reactions that we're picking up. So gel is a little bit more sensitive. 
Um, and so they would say, well, all of our reactions are negative. So number one, it could be a um, low incidence antibody to a low incidence antigen that's on our cells, but not on theirs. Um, or it could be something the patient's reacting to in the gel reagent. Um, we've had that happen before too. Now there's a new drug on the market too for multiple myeloma patients. It's called DARA. Um, I have not personally, it had just been introduced maybe about two years ago. So I have not personally had any experience with it, but I have heard it is a nightmare for blood bankers um, because it really makes the patient look like they have a warm auto. So what they've been doing is uh, the clinicians have been working with blood bank to say, hey, this patient has multiple myeloma. We're fixing to start him on a DARA treatment. Blood bank gets a sample. They do all of their testing before the DARA treatment. So they can establish like a baseline phenotype. Um, and then so I don't think you guys understand what a warm auto does. Your panel is going to be positive. Your IAT is going to be positive. Your VAT is going to be positive. Your elution is going to be positive. Everything is positive, all right? And so um, it comes and then your cross matchers are going to be incompatible. So establishing that phenotype, we could give these patients phenotypically matched least incompatible units. At least we know they're not being exposed to a foreign antigen. All right. Um, even though the units are incompatible, it's that patient's that drug in the patient's circulation that's causing the um, incompatibility. And we have a whole lecture coming up on that drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, so the mechanism behind that, we're going to talk about that. So that might be something um, if you get exposed to a DARA patient looks like a warm auto, that might be something that maybe needs to be sent to the reference lab for confirmation or um, working patient history, working with clinicians on the treatment side to find out if they have received DARA. Okay, so I have printed these out. Let's do some examples um, of what multiple reaction, multiple antibody reactions look like. So I've printed these out for you. Um, for my online students, it is in a folder in your uh, Blackboard course, you can print these in practice. Am I missing one? I had one and I don't know where it went. Oh. Uh, hold on, I can go print you one. Separated from our file. Does everybody else have one? Okay. All right, so let's do um, this first one, panel one. This is uh, Russell Wilson. Here's his initial testing, initial spin 37 and AHG. You do have four negative cells, so see what you can cross off with those negative reactions. Take a look at your reactions too. What phases are you reacting at? Notice that you have panel cells four, six, and nine that are reacting at 37 and AHG. Your first instinct when looking at that, I think it's an RH. RH is notorious for reacting at 37 degrees and then getting stronger at AHG. All right, so your big C, little C, your big E, your little E. Right, those are notorious for doing that. And then you also have some reactions only occurring at AHG. Notice that even one of your AHG reactions is very weak. Keep that in mind too.
So don't anybody blurt it out. I'm going to ask you some specific questions, okay? Yeah. Do you have a question, Lena? Yeah, like no little e, so if like the big E is positive, do you um the, I guess if big E is positive, you can completely cock them off. Some of these examples are not complete panels. I noticed that when I was reviewing them. All right, does everybody have it? Anybody need more time? Okay. So how many antibodies do you think you're dealing with? Two. Do you think the do you think the antibody reacting at 37 and AHG, do you think it's the same antibody? Like the same antibody is causing this reaction at 37 and this reaction at AHG. Maybe. Maybe. What about, take a look at, maybe that's not a good question, because um, it could be, it could be the both from that. It could be both of them causing that strong reaction at AHG. What about well three? With a weak reaction? This one? Mm -hmm. So you definitely have one antibody that's reacting only at AHG, right? You have one antibody that's um, only reacting at 37, but it's actually reacting at AHG too, um, but there's another antibody reacting at AHG as well, right? So this antibody that's reacting at AHG is also reacting here. Okay. All right, so you did your crossing off procedure. What'd you guys get? C and Duffy B. All right, so notice why is panel cell three, why does it have such a weak reaction at AHG? So it is heterozygous for Duffy A and Duffy B. It's heterozygous positive and also C negative, right? So the anti-C is not reacting on that cell, and then it's heterozygous. That's why we have a weaker reaction. Um, why is panel cell 8, why is it only a 1 plus reaction, and panel cell 1? Just have Duffy B reacting on panel cell 1, um, and then panel cell 8 actually has both of them, right? No, no, C negative, sorry. Yeah, so it only has WB, yeah. So that's why those reactions are weaker. 
So does everybody see how you can explain your weaker reactions? All right, that's a good practice to get into as a blood banker. All right, so if you have some varying strengths of reactions, number one is the dosage. Number two, if it's multiple antibodies present, what antibody is reacting on that cell? Is it only one of the antibodies reacting? That will give you a weaker reaction. All right, does everybody see that? Here's what it would look like if you did the Fison treatment. So here's your reactions after Fison. They did initial span 37 and AHD. What happens to your Duffy reactions after Fison treatment? Duffy is deleted. So what reactions only remain after Fison treatment for this patient? The C. So if you look at your pattern of reactivity, you could do the crossing off if you wanted to. Your pattern of reactivity, four, six, and nine matches the anti-C perfect. All right, so this is just running the Fison is two confirmations. Number one, that you are dealing with the Duffy A because it was destroyed, all right? That lets us know that Duffy A was there. And number two, notice how strong your reactions are now, three plus and four plus. Remember that any of your RH antigens are enhanced after enzyme treatment, okay? So that's why our reactions got stronger as well. Cell number eight. Yes, cell number eight only has Duffy B on that one. It's big C negative. And then for Fison. Yes, so notice cell number eight only has the Duffy B. And so after Fison treatment, that um, antigen on the cells is destroyed, so the patient's plasma will not react because it's C negative. All right, I want you guys to make sure, I wanna say this one more time, if you were to do your crossing out procedure after Fison treatment, notice that we actually did cross out the FEB, all right? He is still there. Don't forget, if you do Fison treatment, and, um, just because his reactions went away does not mean you don't have to honor that patient's antibody. You still have to call him. So this patient actually has anti-Big C and the FEB, right? Don't forget about the antibody where the reactions went away, all right? That causes some confusion for students too. Right? The only reason we do those treatments is so we can identify any underlying antibodies. We get rid of some reactions to further confirm the presence or um, of other antibodies, or you know, we can, by doing enzyme treatment, we know that Duffy is destroyed. So that kind of verifies that Duffy is indeed there as well. All right, so it's kind of a twofold purpose. So for the previous panel, you would need to do a bison treatment, or could you just say that he... In this example, I don't really feel like bison is necessarily needed. Um, you have, you would definitely want to make sure your rule of three is followed. You could actually just run some more select cells, too, if your um, facility didn't have enzyme treatment. You could just run some more select cells. Um, it's fairly easy to find FEB negative cells, big C negative cells. So you, you could definitely run some more select cells for definitive identification. But everything else, um, just without enzyme, but like everything else is ruled out. So um, Fison is just a further, um, what's the right word? Um, confirmation. confirmation, yeah. And in this example, it really demonstrates the strengthening of your RH after enzyme treatment. Okay, so here's another one. This is patient Tom Brady. All right, I have a disclaimer on this one. 
Um, in order for it to work and fit your pattern of activity perfect, I updated this. So on panel cell three, it might be different than what is in your manual. Panel cell three is actually going to be heterozygous, which doesn't occur very often in Lewis A and Lewis C, um, but I had to make it, make it that in order to get this reaction. Okay. So what do you guys think? You think you're dealing with one antibody or multiple antibodies? Multiple antibodies, because if you look, cell number two is only reacting for cell number two, uh, four, five, and 10, only reacting at AHG. Cells three, seven, eight, and nine are reacting at all three phases, okay? So you definitely have multiple antibodies going on. So you guys do your crossing off. Did everybody understand what I was saying about this heterozygous? Remember when we were talking about the Lewis family, it's very uncommon to have a person that's positive for both Lewis A and Lewis B. So it's very rare. You will probably never see this on one of your panel cells. Um, you're, you, you're easily either positive for one or the other. Okay? But in order to get these reactions, I, have to away. I don't want to give it away. But. Anybody need more time? Okay, so what do you guys think? A lot of antibodies. A lot of antibodies? Is there one particular group of antibodies that you think might be there? I think E might be there. Lewis family. And what do we think about that Lewis family? Annoying. Annoying, yes. Very much so. What technique could we do? Neutralization, all right? So let's see what our neutralization would look like. All right, so after neutralization, Oh, that's not neutralization yet. This is after your initial cross off, right? This is what you have? Yeah. All right. So we're still thinking maybe Big E, still thinking maybe Duffy A too, right? You can't rule him out yet. And JKB is only half crossed off at this point. Okay, so now neutralization. Here we go. What happened to our Lewis reaction? They went away. Remember, after neutralization, that soluble antigen that's in your commercial um, substance will absorb out your patient's uh, anti-Lewis A or Lewis B. 
pick specified, like for each one, or is it just all? Neutral? It's specified. So your Lewis family will have its own substance. Your P1 will have its own substance. Uh, if you are doing anti H, it'll have its own substance. And for this one, it's specifying Lewis antibodies. So that's yes. Fine. Yes. Oh, so your Lewis is anti Lewis A or B. That's combined together. It's the whole Lewis family. Okay, so after our Lewis neutralization, do we still have some remaining reactions? So there's definitely another antibody there other than our Lewis. Okay, so if you did crossing off on that one. Oh, see, so Duffy A is ruled out, JKB is ruled out. We still have anti-E reacting though, all right? I want to go back. Because since we got rid of them, there's definitely some antibodies for some of Lewis antigens. So would we have to check and see like which specific Lewis antibody we're dealing with? So you would have to, um, after neutralization, this is just to identify any underlying antibodies. So what we're fixing to do, we're going to go back to our panel and we're going to try to figure out, is it Lewis A? Or Lewis B reacting, or is it both? What do you guys think? You guys think Lewis A is reacting? Lewis A is reacting. Notice every cell that is Lewis A positive, you have reactions at initial spin 37 and actually AHG as well, right? Um, and then also notice that you have an E negative cell, it's actually panel cell two, E negative cell that is still positive at AHG. So what could be causing, if it's E negative, we already established that E is reacting, but we still have another reaction at AHG. What's causing that reaction? Lewis B. Lewis B. All right, so you have Lewis B reacting at AHG only. You have Lewis A reacting at initial spin 37 and AHG. Remember when we talked about the Lewis family, I said they were really a nuisance in blood bank, right? They're not really considered um, clinically significant. They can't cross the placenta and their phase of reactivity is all over the board, all right? They can react at initial spin 37 and or AHG. All right, so here are patients reacting Lewis A, initial span 37 and AHG. Lewis B is reacting only at AHG. Right, so this patient, what do you think his genotype is for the Lewis A and B? Uh, a negative B negative? Yes, he has to be Lewis A negative, Lewis B negative. Remember, you have to be negative in order to build the antibody, okay? So he's Lewis A negative, definitely Lewis B negative. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you see how you have to go back and account for every reaction, right? And it's a good idea, and you guys have seen in some of my examples how I'll circle the reactions, all right? Um, and that just lets you know that you have accounted for every reaction in your patient plasma. That identifies every antibody, every reaction, okay? So Sarah asked, what about JKB in panel cell two? It was only half crossed off. Um, so after neutralization though, we were able to completely rule it out. Yeah. If JKB had been there, we would have seen reactions after neutralization. Okay. Yes. So, question was what happened to Duffy? All right. So, in our original panel, we still had Duffy. He's still a potential. Okay. Um, and one thing you can look at too. 
There is a Duffy negative cell, panel cell 10. It's Duffy A negative, but you actually do have a positive reaction here. So that kind of lets you know that it's not Duffy A causing that um, reaction. But after neutralization, Duffy A is no longer reacting, right? The only thing reacting here is E. Does that make sense? So if you were to do your crossing off, did you do your crossing off after neutralization? Yeah. All right, so see, he, um, you have a Duffy A positive with a negative reaction on channel cell uh, two, three, four, seven, and that's it. So you can rule him out. Right? Just like JKB is ruled out too. Remember, he was only half cocked off earlier. They're not affected by neutralization. <laughs> so the only thing we neutralized was Lewis. We absorbed out that patient's anti-Lewis A and Lewis B. So any other antibody that's present would still react. So the only thing that's remaining that is reacting is R E. Why are you doing the um, this is just our initial test. All right, so this was our initial panel testing, and then we picked up on the fact that we have might have some Lewis there causing all of these reactions right here, right? These nuisance reactions. So we can do a neutralization to get rid of them. So this, the next panel, is after neutralization. And then so once we get rid of all those Lewis reactions, we see that Duffy A is not reacting, we see that JKB is not reacting, but it's actually E. I think I'm losing you somewhere. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Right, so if JKB did not react after neutralization, you can rule it out. The same with Duffy A. So I want you guys to understand our patient has three antibodies. Anti-Lewis A, anti-Lewis B, and anti-E, big E. All right, so he has three antibodies. The only way you would know he had three antibodies is after neutralization, you identify E, and then you go back and you match all of your reactions up, all right? So you don't just have one Lewis reacting, you actually have both Lewis A and Lewis B reacting, okay? So you have to use your original reactions and your neutralization reactions. All right, here's panel five. And just look at your initial span 37 and AHG reactions yet. Can you do any crossing off? No. no. Take a look at your um, pattern of reactivity and see if you think a public antigen might be present that this patient has an antibody to. Uh, here's your auto right here. So AC down here is your auto control. Uh, and so here is your reactions for your auto. So that plus four at the bottom doesn't matter. So this is anytime you see reactions written here underneath the column that corresponds to an antigen, this is how your patient phenotyped. All right, so your patient is big E negative. Big K positive, little K Tolano negative. So remember, if they are antigen negative, they could potentially build the antibody to it. All right, this is why that's so important. All right, so if you're given any extra information, this means your patient is big B negative, Tolano positive, or big K positive, Tolano negative.
does the your patient's reaction match your Chilano? With the exception of what? Kennel cell four has a one plus reaction. So we know something else is reacting, right? What treatment did I mention earlier that we could do to get rid of these Chilano? DDT, All right? What, so this is Fison. What happens to um, Kel after enzyme treatment? Usually not affected, all right? So notice that all of these reactions where Chilano is, all stay the same, however, Cell number four, what happened to it? They got stronger. So whatever is reacting on cell four, we know it's either RH, uh, Kid, or Lewis, all right? All right, and then remember, there's another treatment we could do, DTT. It destroys your Kel family antigens, all right? So what do you expect all of those Chilano reactions to do? They're gonna go away. Now you can roll out, right? Now we have some negative cells, right? Kale is actually half crossed off uh, because cell number, number six. He said it was like it's right there with a negative reaction here. Would the Kale be deactivated anyway? Oh, you're right. Do to do. But if he has a four plus phenotype, he probably guess that he doesn't have the autoantibody to big K, right? But when you use DDT, and I'm, I should have, I, I guess I got confused. Um. Anyway, when you use DDT, you can't. Can't rule out any of your cells because it's destroyed. Okay. I was right initially. All right, so what do you guys think? What remains? Big E. Big E. And why is panel cell three stronger? Because 
Yeah, panel cell three is big E positive, little e negative. So it's homozygous, all right? So that's why I say two plus versus your panel cell eight and 10, they are both heterozygous. So we don't need to even look at the count? No, not when you do DDT treatment. Because DDT, DTT is known to destroy cow. So what you would do in a case like this, can't definitively rule out cow, right? He's still there. We know Tolano is reacting. So we could give him um, cow negative blood as well. That might be really hard to find, uh, kill negative and Tolano negative blood, right? That's really where that would be like a kill null phenotype. Um, so if we didn't know this phenotype before. Oh, but he's kill positive. They gave us that. So he couldn't be old kill anyway. But if we didn't have the kill positive down there and we didn't know his phenotype, would we have to check with check cells? because we couldn't rule out the Kell family. So, remember the purpose of check cells. The purpose of check cells is to confirm any negative AHG reactions. So, after your initial reactions here, if you had any negative cells, they would need to be check cells. Um, but since you don't have any negatives, we don't have to worry about check cells on that one. Um, you would have to add antisera to your patient cells. You would actually have to perform that test. So this, the, the panel, without that information at the bottom, you still really can't rule out HA. So what you're going to have to do is anytime you identify an antibody in a patient, you have to confirm that by phenotyping a patient. So if you tell me that your patient has antitolano, you are then going to phenotype your patient to confirm that the patient is Tolano negative, right? And then you would have to do that for big E too. That just lets you know that your patient does have the capability to build that antibody. Right? And because this patient is Kel positive, he can't build a uh, big K. Now, Aaron, to answer your question, um, should you do check cells after the TT treatment, you should probably check cell all of these negative reactions. Remember, the check cells doesn't correlate to any of the antigens. Check cells will just confirm that this is indeed a true negative result. It gets really confusing if I were to add another column in there with check cells, um, then it would be confusing at what you're really looking at. Are you looking at your check cell reactions? Or are you looking at your patient plasma reactions? So for this presentation, it's understood that all negative AHG reactions check cell. All right. So if you're going to give a panel like this on a test, you would give us the phenotype at the bottom? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I might ask you, what do you expect your phenotype results to be? After doing, after giving us the DDT? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this patient would be anti big E and anti Tron? Yes. So this patient has two antibodies. All right, here's your next one, panel six.
All right, anybody need more time? So what do you guys think the primary antibody is? What matches your pattern of reactivity? Perfect. Little c, right? But we still couldn't rule out big E, right? Still couldn't rule out Cal. Um, did you rule out Lewis C? No. So what treatment would you guys do next? You could do Fison, which we don't have for him. Why is panel cell four <coughs> stronger at 37 than all the other cells? All right, I see what you're saying. So it could be little c and big E reacting there. Could it also be Cal reacting there too? But then also you have Cal on this cell too. So you really, you really can't rule any of those out, right? So what would you do? Spicing. What's spicing going to do to the little C reaction? It's going to make them stronger. Could you run some select cells? What type of select cells would you choose? All right, so remember when you run select cells, you want your select cells, we know little c is there, all right? Little c is definitely there. When you choose select cells, they must be negative for the antibody that you have definitively ID'd, all right? So we definitely want our select cells to be little c negative, and then we would want to run big E positive and Cal positive select cells. Why do we want to choose positive antigen for E and Cal? If that cell is little c negative, that cell is not going to react because of that little c, right? If it's big E or Cal, then it would react because of that, all right? And that would definitively, I would actually choose two cells. I would choose uh, little c negative, Cal negative, E positive. And then another cell, little c positive, or sorry, little c negative, e negative, cal positive. All right, that way you could gauge for reactions. If you had negative reactions with both of those cells, what does that tell you? Only little c is reacting. Fison really doesn't help you in this situation because it's going to make all of these reactions stronger. So the, the, what we're trying to do in this situation, we are trying to see if there's any underlying antibodies. Is E truly reacting? Is Cal truly reacting? All right, so we would need some little c negative cells to definitively say that. Um, so before you identify an antibody on a patient, yes, we would have to further find some select cells. So little C negative, JKB positive, uh, and the other one, big S positive too. So Sarah's asking why you need your select cells to be little c negative. We know that the patient has anti-little c. 
we're trying to identify if there's any underlying antibodies, all right? So we don't want a reaction on our select cells due to anti-little C. So we need to select anti-little C negative cells, and then we can choose the antigen expression for all of our other things we're trying to rule out, like JKB positive, um, S positive, KEL positive, E positive, all right? And you might have to pick and choose those cells. That's where it gets kind of complex. Um, it might take multiple cells. You probably have to run about five to six select cells on this patient. And why is Lewis B? So Lewis B, um, I don't really like the fact that Lewis B is crossed off in this example. In your phase of reactivity for Lewis B, he can react at initial span 37 or AHG. Um, and that is primarily due to uh, improvements in our reagents, being able to detect him. So theoretically, because he was not reacting at initial spin, um, they might have ruled him out at that. But because of um, the way he reacts, I would not rule him out. I would still run some select cells. So he's really not ruled out. Sometimes people will look at your phase of reactivity and say that it's not a Lewis family. But Lewis is all across the board now. Um, you can't really do that Sarah's asking, and you know that. Oh, she's asking why you know little c is there. Little c matches your pattern of reactivity perfect. So notice that every cell that is little c positive, you have a reaction at 37 and AHG. That is very typical for an RH to react at 37 and get stronger at AHG. What we don't know is we can't rule out big E and Cal. So that's why we need to run select cells. And really Lewis too. Lewis too, so we want positive on number one. Yes, and plus little c is the only one positive on number one too. But that is not just because E is negative on this cell and Cal is negative on this cell. Um, that's not a definitive rule out. We still have to prove that E and Cal are not reacting. Does that make sense? We still have to cross them out. The crossing out is a blood bank procedure. Um, all of these panels that you guys do will be reviewed by your um, lab manager and the pathologist. So they are going to make sure that everything was ruled out. You could also phenotype your patient um, to see if they have the capability to build E and L as well. Any other questions? Okay. All right, here's panel seven.
What do you guys think? One antibody or more than one? More than one. Which antibody do you expect that you might want to get rid of some reactions? What treatment could we do to get rid of some reactions? Fison. Yes. What antibody is fison going to destroy in this case? Duffy. Which Duffy? A. A. Yes. All right. So here's your fison reactions. So after initial panel, we still have all of these potential antibodies, correct? That we were unable to rule out. Is that what yours looks like? And then Fison gets rid of those Duffy reactions. And then what are we left with? So it's Kel and Duffy A. Why do we suspect, I mean, E is only half crossed off, but why would we not suspect him? It would have been enhanced. After Fison treatment, the same with little c, right? Um, all of your Duffy A reactions went away. If you look at your pattern of reactivity, cell number four and seven are both positive after Fison treatment, which matches Kel perfect. So if you go back to your original panel, let's explain all of our reactions. Panel cell one and two at AHG with a one plus reaction is due to Duffy A. Notice panel four and seven, which are the cells that Kel is reacting, have a stronger reaction, two plus. Right, and notice too that four is actually uh, Duffy, Duffy A negative, and seven is Duffy A negative as well. So it's actually that Kel antibody giving us a two plus reaction. Right, so do you see how different strengths of reactions can um, clue you in on multiple antibodies present? So anti-Duffy A and Kel explain all of our reactions. All right, I think we have time for one more. So here's panel eight. Actually, We'll stop here, it's a good stopping point. We'll pick up on Monday. So my plan is on Monday, we'll finish lecture 11, we'll do 12, we'll do complement. Your exam was scheduled for Tuesday. I'm going to push that back until Friday, but on Tuesday, I need us to meet. We will do lecture 13, which is a review of some pre-transfusion case studies and um, exam to review, right? And then you guys can take the exam on Friday. That work with everybody. I'll send out an official email that details it. Okay. Um, Katie, your question. Uh, panel seven after Fison is only Kel. 
if you are just looking at these two reactions right here, and that matches Kel perfect. And Sarah had a question. <laughs> I thought they were in Blackboard. I will check. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, check lecture eleven. That's where they are. So that's separate. That's just the blank panels. Check the actual lecture eleven presentation. <laughs> 